We are very pleased to welcome three guests today who will discuss practical tips and considerations for those wanting to incorporate OTN or virtual care into their existing practice. Dr. Philip Lamb is the virtual care lead and physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. Dr. Lamb will speak to the system level benefits of virtual care, the transition from studio-based visits to home-based visits, and cover both bright spots and barriers to use. Cindy Wasalu is a registered nurse and OTN engagement lead for the TC Lynn. Cindy will provide a demonstration of the OTN platform and discuss the differences between OTN e-visits and OTN e-consults. And finally, Caitlin Brandon is a project manager with the RGP of Toronto who does much work around specialized geriatric services. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know how to engage with our presenters today. Please type any questions or comments you have in the chat box at any time, and we'll start our question period by 1245. I'll answer the most commonly asked question, can we have a copy of the slides and recording for this webinar? Yes, you can. We'll send them to attendees and post them on our website and YouTube channel. And with that, I'd like to invite Philip to take the stage. Great, thank you so much, Wendy. I'm just gonna share my slides here. I'm just trying to uh, share my slides, it's a bit of an issue here. Okay, we'll get, um, we'll get some help there for sharing your slides, just, just hold on. One second. Philip, you should be able to do it now. Okay, great, I think that works now. Perfect. There we go. Perfect, so yeah, thanks for inviting me to speak today. My name is Philip, I'm one of the infectious diseases physicians at Sunnybrook. And um, today I'll just be talking a bit about uh, our experiences within infectious diseases uh, with virtual care, which we implemented in the past year. And I'll pr provide a bit of perspective uh, in terms of uh, geriatrics as well. So just to provide a bit of context, you know, we all know that uh, the population is aging and there's an increase in chronic disease management and the need for that. We now know that, you know, the majority of the population has access to broadband internet in their household. And there's now increasing expectations from patients uh, as well as their caregivers about the integration of technology into our healthcare system. And so we've kind of witnessed that firsthand uh, with things like online health records where uh, patients and their family can log in to see the results or uh, imaging results or physician documentation. And also some institutions now allow some online booking as well. And so I think the next natural step really is implementing virtual care within uh, our outpatient clinics and kind of that's what we're here to talk about today. In terms of virtual care, uh, from a physician point of view, the most well-known platform is OTN. Uh, and really this is funded by the Ministry of Health. Uh, and so there's really two flavors that virtual care really exists within OTN uh, in terms of you know, doing appointments with patients. So there's the typical hosted video visit, which is a studio visit. And then more recently, direct to patient video visits, which is now available to all um, subspecialists as of November of last year. Just to provide a brief overview of this, uh, the typical studio visit was where a uh, physician would go to a specialized suite within the hospital uh, where they would connect with a patient who would have to travel to their local kind of healthcare facility where there is a studio there. And basically they would connect that way. And so this required a patient to actually travel to their local kind of healthcare facility to really connect with the physician. I think traditionally this was kind of reserved for patients who lived uh, very far away from a specialist and could not actually travel to see the specialist in person. 
In contrast to this, the direct to patient video visit, which is now available as of November 2019, is a more decentralized model where physicians can connect with patients from their own office or clinic space, and patients can then connect from their own home, provided that they have the right technology. And what I mean by that is really a laptop or desktop with a webcam and microphone and an internet connection, or also whether they have access to a smartphone or tablet. And those technology requirements are similar from the physician perspective as well. The main difference here is that the scheduling support for these direct to patient video visits are really self-supported. So really is uh, supported by the physician's administrator assistant or themselves. So in just a brief overview of getting started with this direct to patient video visits, uh, really physicians are basically following three or four steps. The first thing is really filling out the OHIP registration form, which is available online and faxing it in or emailing it. Uh, and then signing up with a one ID account. And this is done through the CPSO website. Once this one ID account is set up, they use this login to otnhub.ca to activate their telemedicine account. If they do plan on having their administrative assistant do booking, then they would also contact the OTN representative to let them know who the administrative assistant would be doing the booking and they'd be giving the training as well as the privileges to do so. And then finally, from a technology perspective, really you know, most physicians already have a desktop or laptop within their office or clinic setting. And it's really a matter of getting a webcam set up, which is actually quite simple to do. You know, most webcams cost at most 30 to $40 and can be plugged in through USB very quickly uh, without really any need um, for additional tech support. So I've been meeting with you know, the different divisions within medicine over the past several months uh, to help facilitate uptake of virtual care. And this has kind of been our approach. So number one, really, how do we identify patients who are appropriate for virtual care? And so we identify inpatients who are going to be discharged or outpatients at one of their follow-up visits who meet the following kind of criteria. Number one, the physical examination or bedside procedure is not required with the next assessment. Or you have a healthcare provider within the home. So, for example, an outreach team that may go to the household and can provide some additional information. Number two, uh, you know, there are no sensory deficits that would impact communication. I think within the geriatrics population, this may be less of an issue as often caregivers are often there with the patient. And so the, the sensory deficit kind of requirement may not actually be that important. Number three, obviously the patient caregiver or healthcare provider on site has access to a computer or a laptop with a webcam or microphone or a smartphone or a tablet. In the case of a smartphone or a tablet, they can download an app which connects with the OTN platform. And finally, travel, time, and financial barriers are always a consideration, although I think this is now becoming less of an issue overall as we're trying to expand virtual care to all patients, even those who live close by. Once you know that you have the right candidate, we then liaise with our administrative assistant to book the appointment. All you really need is a patient's email address. Alternatively, you can use a caregiver's email address or even an on-site healthcare provider or a device designated email address, uh, and then booking the time and the date of the appointment. Once this booking is actually done, the uh, an information email is basically sent to the email address that we had specified, and basically provides the patient or caregiver with instructions on how to set up their desktop or laptop, as well as if they're using a smartphone or tablet, what type of app needs to be installed prior to the visit. There's also a link to test your device prior to the visit to make sure that things are in working order, as well as an OTN support line if the patient or caregiver uh, runs into any problems. And then on the day of the visit, basically the uh, patient or caregiver clicks on the start e-visit button within the email, which launches a browser-based connection if you're using a laptop or desktop, or it automatically launches the app on your smartphone or tablet. And finally, the physician on the day of the appointment logs into otnhub.ca and basically completes the appointment. I believe Cindy will be giving a demonstration of that. In terms of common technical issues we encounter, I'd say from my experience and from speaking to virtual care users, I'd say 75 to 80% of the time, there's really no, you know, no technical difficulty that occurs. 
Um, things that we do to try to minimize technical difficulties, we advise using a, uh, you know, a wired computer with internet connection as a, opposed to wireless connection for the provider end just to eliminate any potential issues with a weak signal. If you have a strong wireless signal, this shouldn't be an issue. There's also mirror and connectivity tests that the healthcare provider can perform prior to their visit to make sure that things are working from their end. As I mentioned earlier, there's an email to the patient or caregiver to do the setup and troubleshooting. Probably the most common technical difficulty that I encounter, uh, which is pretty uncommon, is that the sound doesn't work from the patient end. So they can hear the healthcare provider, uh, but I cannot hear them. And so what I do typically to overcome this is I actually call them through a telephone line to their cell phone or their, their landline to use that as the audio. In terms of the billing, so as of um, currently, basically, there is a premium tracking code, a $0 tracking code that's used for these OTN virtual care visits. And that is billed in conjunction with your assessment code. And so depending if you have a healthcare provider at the patient's home who can provide additional physical exam information, your assessment code will vary depending on your ability to fulfill those requirements. Uh, you can also use a patient counseling code if you know a lot of your care being provided is counseling to the family or the patient. And that's really it from a billing perspective is actually very straightforward. In terms of the benefits, you know, there is significantly reduced travel time, which has financial implications for patients. Patients save a lot of money in terms of parking. Um, there's improved care coordination and continuity and improved access to expert medical advice and support. From the provider standpoint, I think you know, a lot of institutions are moving towards virtual care, and so this is a very hot topic and aligns well with institutional priorities. There's increased capacity to provide care without the need for physical infrastructure, and there's increased efficiency and flexibility from a provider point of view. And finally, I think there's also remuneration potential, as often physicians will call patients by telephone to provide additional counseling or advice, which currently is not really uh, funded through the Ministry of Health. So using a more formal virtual care visit, I think, has potential as well. So I'll just leave with these final tips. When we introduce virtual care, I think, you know, the first virtual care visit is the biggest barrier for the healthcare provider. Just being comfortable using the platform and being able to connect with the patient is the most important thing. And then after that, I think it becomes a lot easier and I think there's a lot, a lot less anxiety around using the technology. I'd encourage people to offer virtual care, even those who live close by. You know, in the geriatric population, I think this is particularly relevant. Uh, where the frail elderly may have a lot of difficulties with mobility, particularly in the winter months where, you know, it can be a risk, uh, you know, traversing, you know, slippery environments uh, outside. So we offer this uh, to everyone in our infectious disease clinic if deemed uh, appropriate candidate. I think there's a lot of exciting potential for coordination with CCAC and other uh, healthcare providers in the community to get connected with OTN and virtual care. You know, doing virtual care doesn't mean that you have to do virtual care with every visit. We've had kind of models where every other visit is a virtual care visit, and I think patients do appreciate this. From an infectious disease point of view, we've also been able to identify potential candidates based on certain syndromes. So we know that there are certain syndromes where physical examination is not required. And I think there are exciting potentials for models to be built around certain syndromes uh, in terms of follow-up assessments with virtual care. And finally, I think, you know, when you first start off, start off with just one or two and book them at the beginning or the end of your current clinic. We, we find that virtual care visits, patients tend to be on time and the visits tend to be actually a lot shorter than inpatient visits uh, because, you know, often patients have other things to do in their day and they are very happy to communicate with you in a very concise manner through virtual care. So finally, I'll leave you with this. This is uh, infectious diseases virtual care. We now average about 25 virtual care visits per month, and all six uh, ID physicians at Sunnybrook now use virtual care. We've also used this model where we have an iPad device at the Holland Center, which is an orthopedic center, where basically the nurse brings a tablet to the bedside uh, for patients that are 
being consulted for you know, an infectious disease involving a bone or joint. And so on the right hand here, we have Dr. Dandeman, who's one of the ID doctors who's communicating with a patient at the bedside. Uh, and this has basically um, eliminated the requirement for either us to travel to the Holland Center or for the patients at the Holland Center to be transferred by ambulance to our clinic for assessment. And so patients have really found this to be very useful. All right, so I'll end there. And obviously I'll be here at the end to answer any additional questions. Great, thank you for that. So we'll turn the stage over to Cindy now and I'll remind participants to feel free to type any questions they have into the chat box and we'll start uh, question and answers around 1245. So Cindy, please take the stage. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. L um, that was a, a very good overview and I'm, <laughs> you can come and, uh, come and work for us now because it's uh, given quite a lot of, uh, of good insight. Um, so let me just get to sharing uh, my screen. And hopefully, hopefully we can see that. That's great. We can see it. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm Cindy Wasilu. I am, am the engagement lead for Toronto Central from OTN. So I actually support uh, Sunnybrook and all the um, healthcare uh, hospital organizations in Toronto Central with the development and implementation of virtual care programs. So happy, happy to be here. Some of the uh, some of the information is going to be a bit repetitive, just based on what Dr. Liam said. But I'll go through those parts, but and, and get get make sure I get to the demo, uh, so you can actually see it in action. So who are we as OTN? We're one of the largest uh, telemedicine networks in the world. We've been around uh, as, a, as a provincial network for um, probably about almost 15 years now. Prior to that 15 years, we were actually, and there was three different networks in the province, one in the north, one in the east, and one in the west, um, that then collaborated together to become one provincial network. And the idea was that we were, um, we were uh, being able to provide imp improved access to care, especially for the rural areas, uh, with more efficient delivery and collaboration between the partners uh, around the province. Um, but as we know, we were developed initially as a, um, you know, patients who lived in rural areas to be able to uh, connect with urban consultants, but it's over the years have developed into uh, a much more um, robust technology with the technology advancements in what we can do within the changing landscape of, of um, healthcare. So who we are, we're a non-for-profit organization that's funded by the government of Ontario. We have um, over 3,000 organizations that are part of OTN or are OTN members with uh, 26,000 providers uh, that have access to our services via the, the software uh, OTN Hub uh, platform that we have. Um, and we also have partnered with provincial delivery organizations. So all of the LINs have been connected uh, to us. eHealth Ontario is now part of our, one of our partners to be able to get access. KO, which is the Kiwatanok Okamakanek, if I've seen that correctly, um, First Nations community um, up in the north, that's a federally, federally run community that we have uh, multiple different uh, technology systems up there to be able to connect to that community. Um, eHealth is uh, part of that. Ontario MD for um, assistance with some of our e-consult. Champlain Base, which is the um, building access to specialists through e-consult. So I'll talk a little bit about that a bit later. WEAVE, which is the Women's College Hospital Institute for Health System Solutions and Virtual Care. We partner with them on quite a lot of our um, evaluation um, uh, metrics and evaluation um, uh, help so that any of these programs that are running up, we can see how what the benefits are and the ROIs for organizations can be. And Canada Health InfoWave for some funding opportunities. So, um, you know, what are we talking about? So this, over the last number of years, virtual healthcare um, has been able to now come into the patient's home as technologies evolved um, and finally as policies are changing um, which was been a, which was a big barrier uh, for a long time we're now able to bring the technology to the patient not only through video but through even other means of uh, remote patient monitoring um, online peer uh, platforms for uh, mental health and addictions and, and a number of different um, uh, of models so we're improves, improving access to care empowering people living with chronic diseases or mental health challenges to self-manage, and implementing connected care solutions that enable team-based care and support patients and their caregivers. Um, so what is telemedicine? And, and you may have heard the term, the term has been interchanged. Some people use the word telehealth, some people use telemedicine, some people now evolving to virtual care because it's not just 
um, you know, it's not just about connecting one technology to another technology. Um, but the idea of it has been using innovative technologies to bring clinical care and or education to patients and healthcare providers across the province. And with OTN, the idea was doing this over a secure and private network, which is what it's been up, which is what we've, we've built over the last 15 years. So the idea that all patient health information would be um, protected via this network. So just a, just a quick overview of what traditional telemedicine has been over the years. Um, as Dr. Lam alluded to, there was, uh, or had stated, there, these are the systems that people were traditionally using. So um, they were either using a clinical cart, which is on the patient end, uh, where the patient would go to that host studio and a nurse would be at the end of the host studio and connect uh, or connect the video portion of this clinical cart and the clinician would be able to see them pan around the camera. There's peripheral um, uh, equipment that they use to be able to connect and see what's happening with an ophthalmoscope. There's a stethoscope as well. Uh, the room-based systems, which you may or may not be familiar with, with some of the, a lot of the organizations have these in their uh, auditoriums or in meeting rooms to be able to connect to others um, for meetings or education. Um, but also used for, for, for clinical care when needed, and these desktop systems that do the, essentially the same thing, but in smaller portion. But over the, since the last um, at least six or seven years, we've created something that's now mobile, so more uh, utilizing a software-based uh, uh, platform uh, through something called the OTN Hub. Uh, so it's where our providers can now utilize and connect to patients utilizing their own laptops or computers uh, and have access to a number of services that OTN offers. So when we talk about um, what Dr. Lam was talking about with direct-to-patient video, there's been a number of terms of that, uh, guest link, OTN invite. Uh, now the terminology that we're wanting to use is e-visit to, to, to let us um, uh, de define what a synchronous video conferencing is, it is e-visit. So for providers, this hub enables that um, room-based online and mobile video connections within the network. So you can use the hub to connect to room-based systems traditionally or to patients directly at home. And for patient, it offers them some flexibility and the ability to be able to see and stay in their own places uh, and with using their device of their choice. So in the last year, we've facilitated over 1.2 million connections to video events across over 3,400 room-based systems and 25,000 users. Um, so with direct to patient virtual visits specifically to home, uh, 75,000 video events last year. Um, this year, I think we're on track to do well over 100,000. Um, so it's the idea of having that synchronous video to be able to connect to patients in their home where they can use their own devices, as we've talked about. And in November, the ministry announced that um, all physicians in Ontario, including primary care physicians that met specific criteria, are able to uh, bill for these visits um, as they normally would um, with, with the B099 code, as Dr. Lamb spoke about. Um, just a snapshot, and I'll get into the live demo on what it looks like as a provider end. You're logging in with uh, one ID or OTN credentials, depending on who you are and where you like, what organization you're working with. You get a, a, a screenshot, a screen pop up in your video conferencing window that looks very similar to what you may be familiar with with other, you know, um, other softwares like FaceTime and and um, and WhatsApp. Um, and then there's a calendar. Uh, it's put into your calendar. You can open it up via that way. And you actually also have the option to print off a uh, appointment detail uh, if you're scheduling, for example, this visit while the patient is in the office. The provider side, or sorry, the patient side, they receive the email. Uh, they have an open, uh, they, they um, click on the link. And as you can see, there's an app if they're going to use a device that they would download to be able to um, open that event. The event is only one way, i.e. the patient cannot um, initiate a call. The patient essentially, if they log on before the provider, sits in something called a waiting room until the provider actually connects in. Each link is unique. Uh, there is, it only lasts for approximately 24 hours, and then the link URL essentially dies. So that's to help with the protection of the privacy um, for PHIPAA privacy. Um, and to make sure that it's a provider initiated and that patients can't just uh, video you at any time that they uh, wish to. Um, and then on the desktop, you can just see that bottom screenshot there is what it looks like. There's no app, nothing to download, no, no plugins to put in. It just opens up on your desktop when you're using Chrome or Firefox and you enter in your name. 
Uh, so Dr. Lai talked a lot about a great um, best practices. So we have guidelines, we have lots of information on our website that actually provides you with that, um, you know, who to choose, what kind of environment they should be in, um, sort of some great tips about, um, about how to start using virtual care within your practice. So that's a video, e-consult, just to do quickly um, overview of what e-consult is, as, as we understand sometimes those two things get interchanged and people don't quite understand what the difference is. E-consult is an asynchronous type of um, a platform that we have on the OTN hub that allows providers, uh, primary care um, or specialists and or nurse practitioners to be able to submit a clinical question to an, another specialist, thus avoiding hopefully um, re unnecessary referrals. So within the OTN Hub platform, you have the ability to do this um, e-consult by uh, finding out what it is that, uh, who's available. So there's a number of different specialties that are available either through what we call a base specialty uh, model, which is a regional model where the consults would go to somebody within your region or a provincial model where it could go to anybody within the uh, within the region. So if you had a clinical question by um, uh, about a patient for uh, understanding how to titrate a mental health uh, or a psychiatric drug because they're pregnant or whatever it might be, you can ask that. You can find who it is that you'd like to speak to about it or like to uh, have a, ask a question about it, submit their information, and that gets then submitted to that particular physician or group who then goes in on their own time, generally within about two to three business days, um, sometimes within five minutes, just depends on the clinician, reviews the question, answers what they can, and sends it back to you as the, as the primary care provider. So trying to maintain care with that patient um, within their own primary care uh, provider and not having them have to have lengthy wait times. So the program itself is actually managed by the eConsult Center of Excellence out of Ottawa. So they were the ones that originally started with BASE a number of years ago. Um, and they're the ones that actually provide remuneration to the consultants for those questions on an hourly basis. Um, pr practitioners who are sending the consults do get um, a, uh, be, are able to submit a OHIP billing code for it, um, as opposed to, uh, you know, email, which may or may not be um, remunerated. So, so the nice things about eConsult is that it's trackable. Uh, you can pull reports and put them into an EMR, um, and you can quickly and easily get some answers about your patients uh, without having to send them in for uh, an unnecessary referral. So this, uh, Dr. Lam went over quickly, or I'll just go over it quickly, I should say, um, just as far as how to get access. So oh, the way that people get access generally, the majority of people are now going on and getting one ID, uh, which is um, through eHealth Ontario to be able to log in. We only partnered with one ID a number of years ago. So there are people from uh, a while ago that used, the way that it used to log in was through OTN credentials. And also if you have more than one organization you're working for, then you, those would be what we would have to do. If you're unsure whether or not you have a One ID account or an OTN account, you can either contact myself or One ID directly um, to find out what your next step should be. Uh, okay, so that's about it from the presentation. Now I'm going to uh, share my screen for uh, and show you the demo. Hold on, I'm just gonna stop sharing that. And there we go. Okay. Can I, uh, hopefully you guys can see that now. We can. Perfect. Okay. So in order to do, um, in, in order to uh, do this, you go to otnhub.ca. And as you can see, there's a number of different resources on here, et cetera. But in order to, to be able to, to send an invite, you click your login button. Most, of, most people will be using one ID. I will be using one OTN credentials. You type in your username and password. You sign in. Cindy, there seems to be a lot of flashing um, from your screen. It's sort of refreshing at a, a very oh. fast flash rate there. Oh, that's, I'm not sure why. Hold on. Let me just see if I can restart. Let me stop it and then I'll restart it again. Okay. Is that better? So far, so good. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Um, okay. 
So this is the main page that you will see when you get in. Uh, to be, and it, these are some quick links to be able to do a number of different, um, have access to a number of the different services that we do have. So you can do just a, a right away connect with patients at home, enter that patient's email address. You can make a video call to somebody else who has a OTN uh, account, either individually or a room system. Uh, finding a host site is just about um, when a patient does need support, when they do need to go to a host uh, environment and to be supported by a nurse, whether it's for physical assessment, lack of technology or um, other, uh, you can find where those are located within the province. Uh, the find a specialist is e-consult um, as well. It, well, ask a clinical question is e-consult and sorry, the find a specialist should just be anyone um, is actually our directory, which now um, has every provider in Toronto Central Lynn, healthcare, uh, through, through any, any kind of provider, whether or not they do telemedicine or not, or virtual care is listed within this directory. So that's uh, sort of quick and quick and dirty on that. But in order to do the video conferencing that we're looking to do, you would click down here to your video conference. This is the easiest way to see. You see a calendar. You click this connect to button and you can see you can either connect to an OTN member, so somebody else who has an OTN account or a room-based system, or you can collect a connect to a guest. So a guest meeting a patient directly or a patient's caregiver, uh, whomever it is that's going to be opening up their email. You type in the name of whoever you, you were uh, wanting to, type in their email address. I'm just going to put my Gmail in there. You can actually add up to uh, seven participants in one call. So this is beneficial if you have, um, let's say, you know, there's a caregiver with the patient in one location. However, the, the patient's daughter or mother or father or whomever is not in that same location, but would like to participate in whatever conference or discussion or meeting or appointment that you're having, you can add those people in there. So it becomes like a multi kind of call as, a, as almost like a case conference. Um, you then would um, enter a host pin. So if, if you're doing, as a clinician, doing uh, this type of work over top of your, uh, out of your OTN hub on your desktop, you do not need a pin to uh, join. The reason the pin is there is for clinicians who want to join um, outside of utilizing their own desktop or laptop. So they can join via an iPad or their phone, um, or if they don't have uh, their login information and their admins are scheduling it, for example, uh, this is a way to join two parties together that essentially act as guests um, and would, and in order for that to be protected, we request a pin. So people have utilized, um, you know, different ways of creating this pin so that they would remember that it doesn't have to be the same every time, but something does need to be in there. For clinical events, the idea here is just to capture some data. So we can either title it to say, um, it can either be a clinical learning or meeting, which is education or administrative. And you can say, you know, follow up with CW. So with your initials, we recommend not putting in full names just from a privacy to make sure it's all protected. So you're discussing one patient who is present and you are the consulting healthcare practitioner. There's a variety of options here based on the scenario that's happening, but this is generally the, the most uh, common one. You can actually either do this where you connect now. So you can actually click it and say, if, like if, you, if a patient has phoned and said, I would like, um, you know, and, and you as the clinician decide, let me, let's do a call right now. You can click the connect now, the patient would receive the email and be able to open it right away without having to schedule it in advance. You just have a little bit of a delay because you're the one on the call initially and the patient would have to uh, wait for that email to come in. Or you click the schedule for later, you find your date and time, um, and you enter it in and how long you want your appointment for. There's a calendar button here. And then you click schedule. A window pops up for you to confirm your information is correct. Uh, note that the email address must be correct because there is no way of um, having, there's no bounce back. This comes from an OTN do not reply email address and there's no way for the system to recognize whether the email has gone through or not. Uh, so please be sure that it's correct, um, and, that's, and that's how it will go. You can also view the patient and handout here to be able to print it off if you'd like. And then you click Schedule, and then the next window pops open, and that's your appointment. And if you go back to your calendar, you'll now see the event put into your calendar here, okay? 
So the patient on their end, I created one from yesterday, will receive this email as Dr. Lamb had said. Uh, they actually have an option to put it into their calendar. So if they actually use, if they use some type of calendar, Google Calendar or um, Apple Calendar, they can actually add it into their own calendars as a reminder. This is the email that is sent, as Dr. Lamb had said, had said, and it actually gets resent to you 24 hours prior to the appointment if the appointment's been scheduled ahead of time. So then back to here, in order for you to join as a clinician, here is the button on the day of that you would push. Uh, it won't really work because I'm on my, I'm using my video camera or it's, it's connected to this call, but this is the idea of what will happen. Um, so I'll probably, oh, it'll come, it's coming up. There it is. Look at that. See, <laughs> I guess because my video is off. Uh, so this is the screen that you would see as the clinician and you would be waiting for the patient to join. And there's a number of different functionalities down here. You can share your screen um, where it's similar to what we're doing right now in Zoom and um, uh, to be able to share test results or you know, imaging, that kind of thing, if you'd like. Um, and uh, you can turn your camera on and off, a number of different options, but um, this is essentially basically how it goes. I don't know if you can see that, hopefully. And that's about it. So I'll stop sharing. All right, so I think that's the end of my presentation, so. Great, thank you very much, Cindy. That was very interesting and informative. Um, we'll ask Caitlin to take the stage now and we'll invite um, attendees to just type in any questions they have so far in the chat box and we'll take questions at the end. Thanks, Wendy, and uh, thank you, Philip and Cindy, for all that uh, very awesome information and, and practical uh, showcase of how the system works. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting um, some some practical considerations for incorporating virtual care into existing practice. Um, so, the information on the coming slides is really a compilation of tips and tricks and ideas um, that were pulled from discussions that we had here at the RGP with. With um, both geriatric and other clinicians who have had experience using OTN. So this all began with a survey that we developed and sent out to our geriatric clinicians. Um, in the end, we had 44 survey respondents and 50% of those who responded were actually already using OTN to connect either with patients um, or to connect with other healthcare professionals. So in part one of this webinar mini-series, for those who connected back at the end of January, um, we really heard there about a lot of very structured programs that incorporate OTN to increase access to specialized geriatric services. Things like telemedicine, Impact Plus, um, Sinai has a dedicated virtual care um, nurse that goes out and connects um, frail older patients um, or those with a complex chronic conditions um, to specialists. Um, for, for here, um, we are, we're going to focus really on how to incorporate e-visits. So Cindy went over the difference there between e-visits and e-consults. So how to incorporate e-visits um, by using sort of a practical step-by-step -step approach. And by no means is this the only way to determine somebody's, um, you know, eligibility or whether or not they would be good, a good candidate to consider for an e-visit, but it's kind of a nice simple approach particularly for clinicians who have maybe never used OTN to begin with and you can then build upon this um, uh, you know as you go along um, to to potentially broaden your scope of those who you think may be good to connect So here's our sort of five step approach. It's uh, sort of five simple steps, a um, bit of a, a decision tree um, to determine the appropriateness of virtual care for a frail older adult um, or a patient to be seen by a specialized geriatric service. So we start at the top with the type of visit, um, then take into consideration any sensory or cognitive limitations they might have. Um, next is whether or not they, they genuinely have interest in connecting that way. Um, next is whether they have of the appropriate technology and lastly 
uh, if they don't necessarily want to connect, um, as Cindy had mentioned, whether or not there's somebody else potentially in their circle of care, another family member that uh, may benefit from being able to use OTN to participate in, a, in an appointment with them. So we'll go through each of these steps in a little bit more detail. So starting off is the type of visit. Um, Follow-up visits that do not require a physical examination are likely best suited for a virtual care appointment with this type of population. Um, the presence of a healthcare professional in the patient's home on the other end, whether that's connecting through a community service or um, Lynn Home and Community Care, um, those are potential options for having somebody on the patient's end. Um, so if that's the case, that may allow for certain exams or assessments to be done with that patient. But if that's not a possibility, you would likely be looking at an appointment that didn't require a physical exam. So something to ask yourself is just the, that very simple question, is a physical exam required? And if the answer is no, then great, we'll continue on to the next step. If the answer is yes, you do need some sort of a physical exam, then the question is, could a healthcare professional be present in the patient's home? Um, another consideration potentially to be made is, for example, if, if it's just some sort of a simple mobility type thing, um, you know, is the patient able to do that either with a care provider there to keep watch on them, um, or whether or not, based on your knowledge of that patient, perhaps they can still do some of those simple things on their own and communicate that information to you. So if a healthcare professional could be present, then again, continue on. If they can't, then this is where you stop and likely they're not a good candidate to participate in a virtual appointment. Step number two is considering their sensory and potential cognitive limitations. So obviously their ability to hear you, to see you, to understand you, and for you to do the same for them um, is a, a very important factor when considering this type of appointment. So you may want to ask yourself, does the patient have a significant visual hearing uh, limitation? Um, and from a cognitive perspective, because certainly uh, we know that a lot of the geriatric patients may have certain levels of dementia. So from a cognitive perspective, would a virtual visit cause either confusion or agitation to the patient? Um, or would it make it unreasonably difficult to communicate with them? So if the answer to, answers to the above are no, great, let's continue to the next step. If the answer is yes to any of the above, then you may want to consider whether that, whatever that limitation is, is potentially well managed either with AIDS, um, you know, it, does, a parent, does a patient consistently wear um, their hearing aid uh, or do they not? Some do, some don't. Do they have glasses that allow them to see a little bit better? Um, or is there a caregiver around that can provide assistance to help mitigate those potential limitations? So if the answer to that is yes, great, we'll continue on. If it's no, then again, stop here. They may not be a good candidate for a virtual visit. The next step is to ask them if they are interested. Um, and this could be to the patient or to the patient and the caregiver, if the caregiver is present. Um, so we've put a little bit of a, a blurb here and you're welcome to memorize it and use it verbatim. Sometimes those, uh, those word cues are helpful at the beginning. So you could ask for your next appointment, would having the opportunity to connect with me by video from the comfort of your home be of interest to you instead of coming in person? And in some ways, this is your opportunity to, to do sort of a bit of a sales pitch for the benefits of using OTN. Um, many of them have likely never been offered the opportunity to connect to a healthcare professional this way. Um, they may be a little apprehensive or not sure how it works. So, um, you know, take this opportunity to, to explain some of the benefits to them, things like avoiding parking costs, they will, won't have to worry about any travel time. For a lot of frail older adults, um, you know, getting packed up, traveling, getting parked, getting into a clinic, waiting at a clinic or for their appointment, and then, you know, getting back home um, expends an awful lot of energy and uh, subsequently they're quite exhausted by the end of the day. So this may help to avoid that for them. 
And then you can use examples that a lot of people are very familiar with that potentially they or their caregivers are used to using already on their personal devices. So, uh, you know, are they familiar with FaceTime or Skype or WhatsApp? Um, because the overall platform is really very similar to all of those types of um, uh, programs that many people use already to connect with family and friends. So if the answer is yes, they are interested, excellent, let's continue to step four. And if they're really not interested in that at this point, then uh, that's okay. That's where the questioning ends. As we've covered before, there is certainly a, um, a, a minimum set of technology that is required for a patient or their caregiver to connect via OTN. So you can ask them, in order to connect, there is some minimal equipment required. And do you have access to either a computer, a laptop, or a smartphone with a speaker and a microphone? Do you have a stable internet connection? And do you have an email address? And lastly, um, because they may still have all of this, and after hearing the spiel, um, the question is, do you feel comfortable using this equipment? So they may know that they have it, but they you know, maybe only use it when another family member is around, and potentially that's not an option. Um, so is it possible to feel comfortable using that equipment? So if at this point they say yes, everything seems to be good to go, and you can collect their email address in order to book the appointment, which would be through the same um, process that uh, both Dr. Lamb and Cindy have uh, alluded to previously. And uh, if the answer is no, then they don't have the equipment or they're really not comfortable using it, then you can either stop at this point or step five is sort of an optional step. Um, and step five is, again, including the circle of care. So you can use OTN, as we've discussed before to connect individuals other than the patient. It may be a family member or some other key person in the patient's circle of care, whether it's a friend or another caregiver. And, um, and these types of people may not be able to attend an appointment for various reasons. They may be too far away or they may be out of province. They may not have flexible work hours to be able to attend an in-person appointment with the patient, um, or they may have accessibility issues themselves. So if it is the case and there is somebody who potentially you would like to connect into an appointment, you can ask the patient if they're cognitively capable of responding, you know, do you consent to having this person attend your next appointment by video? And once again, if the answer is yes, wonderful, you can get an email address to uh, link them into that appointment. If the answer is no, then you can stop. And so in this case here, the patient themselves may attend uh, with you in person, um, but you can use the technology to connect in a family member. And with, with this particular piece here, the, really the whole idea is to think outside the box. So OTN really, it can be used in creative ways. Um, and we heard about some of those even in our first webinar at the end of January. Um, things like the day hospital at Baycrest who uses iPads that they send home with patients to do a home assessment. So they, they connect with the patient with an iPad that they provide to them to do a home assessment. Uh, in a situation where they wouldn't usually be able to go travel to the patient's home. Um, and uh, some of the teams at, at Baycrest, they're outreach teams, even though the outreach member does go to the patient's home, so they're in the home setting with the patient, but they use OTN to connect in family members who may be too far away or out of province. So just a few final thoughts before we um, open things up to questions. Uh, as Philip alluded to earlier, the biggest barrier to using OTN really is conducting that first appointment. And it's not likely to feel comfortable at first, but certainly the feedback that we've received from others who have been using it for a longer period of time tell us that um, the benefits certainly much far outweigh the barriers. Um, and virtual care, it, it's not for everyone. The idea is that it's something that you can have in your toolbox. It's something that you can use when it's appropriate, but it's not going to be for everyone. Um, and consider it as a potential tool to reduce no-show rates and really to increase access to specialized geriatric services. 
Um, the, the patient population that you serve, um, you know, it doesn't contraindicate the use of virtual care, uh, which is sort of a message I think that in some cases we've been receiving from certain clinicians who haven't had experience and they're really unsure of how this could possibly work for the types of patients that they see. Um, and lastly, there's help. Um, most hospitals, if you work in a hospital setting, um, you likely have some sort of a virtual, uh, virtual care lead at your hospital. There is likely a suite with a OTN coordinator that you could go to for some assistance. Um, and uh, as, as Cindy has mentioned, you can contact OTN directly for support. Um, so we really just, we hope that this information has sort of opened, uh, opened you to consider it as an option for this patient population uh, and really just not something to be dismissed outright. Great, thank you very much, Caitlin. And thanks to all of our presenters for sharing your experience with virtual care. We have time for questions now, so we'd invite attendees to please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. Uh, make sure you change the two from uh, all uh, presenters to all presenters and attendees so we can all see your questions. I'll also invite the presenters to turn on their web cameras if they have them and if they are able so the audience can see the presenters. And while the webcams are being turned on, if they're able, I'll start uh, reading the questions out from attendees. There's some good ones here. So there's two that are a little bit similar. One is asking, do e-visits need to include video or can participants use only the phone? And a second question is, what if the patient's laptop computer doesn't have a camera? Does it mean the e-visit won't work for this patient? So I can answer that. So from a clinician perspective, for billing purposes, e-visit does require a video uh, to be part of that through the OTN Hub platform. Um, just doing a phone directly is not at this point uh, billable. Um, so, so yes, there same idea as if the patient does not have a video camera on their their laptop or desktop um, or a device, um, then a e-visit would may not be the best option for them. Um, so there is work with the ministry currently right now to uh, look at all the various modes of connecting, uh, whether it's through text, through audio, through email, and what that may look like um, in the future, um, especially with, o with the OHTs for remuneration for clinicians, but um, as, of, as of right now, uh, having the video is, uh, is what you do need for an e-visit. Great, thanks for that clarification. Uh, another question that's come in is, is a um, consent form needed for patients to be able to participate? It's Cindy again. So some, and I'll, I'll let Dr. Lam um, comment as well. Some organizations have, um, uh, it depends on the organization and the provider. Some will uh, take that email as if you're receiving an email from the patient as an implied consent, sort of similar to when you're creating an appointment for them in person. And other organizations like to have a separate uh, consent form. Know that the video calls are not recorded. So it is purely uh, uh, just a as is and, uh, and nothing is recorded on any of those clinical calls, um, which may help organizations to decide what they do, but that's generally, um, generally the, the, what people are doing is either having that implied consent or some are doing some consents depending on, on their privacy restrictions, et cetera, within the whole organization. I don't know if Dr. Lamb, you have anything for that? Yeah. So the virtual care users at Sunnybrook don't really use a formal consent form. Um, what we've been doing is in our, documentation of the visit that precedes the virtual care visit, we will say something like we've discussed the option of virtual care with the patient and they're agreeable to this. And that's what I've been doing. Okay. And similar, uh, just to top on that, when you are documenting the visit itself, documenting that it was done virtually um, is, is also a, a good practice. Great. Questions are flying in, so people are very interested in what you folks have had to share here. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Uh, a question about, do you have data on the most common reasons for e-visit consultations? Which are the reasons, conditions? Is there a percentage that require physical exam, cognitive exam, exam or deprescribing? It's a great question. I think it really depends on the specialty uh, that the physicians are working in. So. 
Unfortunately, I'm an infectious disease physician, so I can't really comment on the geriatric population, but just to give you an overview within infectious diseases, there are some very common syndromes that we are using uh, for basically virtual care. So one of them would be latent tuberculosis treatment, for example. These are patients who don't have an active infection but are receiving a nine-month course of antibiotic therapy. And really, our visits are really to connect with patients to make sure they're tolerating their treatment and to make sure that their blood work is normal. So I'd say a lot of the virtual care visits are really um, latent tuberculosis treatment. The other big population that we use it for are bone and joint infections when they are finishing their treatment course, which can be upwards of three months. There's really nothing that we see on physical exam, so it's really, it doesn't really add to our assessment. Uh, so those are kind of the more common uh, syndromes that we will use virtual care. In terms of numbers, right now we have six ID physicians at Sunnybrook, and we will do about 25. Oh, sorry, we seem to have lost some connectivity there. The screen is frozen there with Dr. Lim. There we go. You okay. Great. Yeah. So I'll just say again, so from a numeric point of view, we see about 25 to 30 virtual care follow-up visits per month. And um, so basically it's one to two virtual care visits per clinic for most providers. We've really been focusing on follow-up assessments, to be honest, for our virtual care, because I think that's the lowest hanging fruit for us. I think in the future we will visit whether consultations are possible. So from any of the discussions that we've had... Got some freezing there again on your end, Caitlin. Can you hear us now? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay. Um, uh, from the geriatric, uh, sorry, from the geriatric side, uh, similarly, it is follow-up visits. So, for example, a, a comprehensive geriatric assessment has already been completed at, uh, for example, a clinic appointment, um, and this is potentially a, a three-month follow-up type visit, where again, the the physical examinations are not required. It's potentially a check-in. Um, uh, you know, a, a care plan has been put into place, and so it's a discussion with the patient and or their their caregiver to to see how things are, are going along and to assess whether or not another follow-up appointment would potentially be needed in another you know three six nine months. Yeah, and certainly follow-up appointments are definitely one of the largest. It is the biggest uh, reason for or utilizing virtual care. Um, I'll give you an example with uh, mental health. Mental health is, is a great um, you know, area where this is, is easily um, uh, put in place, especially for those who have had a first-time consult with a psychiatrist and they may be doing some ongoing treatment and for those patients that are not high, super high risk. So there's for those uh, groups like this, the entire mental health group at Sunnybrook, for the most part, are, are utilizing this in, in that way um, and doing a lot more visits now uh, a day than, um, than even in person in some, in some cases. So, um, so definitely depends on the scenario, but, um, uh, but, but a lot of good use cases could be come out of it. Great. We're actually running to the end of the hour here, and, uh, but we didn't run out of questions. So I'm wondering if our presenters might be able to point people in a good direction for more information. Sure. Anything, you can come to our website. It's uh, otn.ca that will provide you with a lot of information and also otnhub.ca if you want to look at how to sign up. Um, and then I'm sure Dr. Lamb is a good source of uh, resource as well <laughs> from an uh, organizational standpoint and how to... Um, to uh, embed virtual care into a practice. Yeah, I mean, I've been working very closely with Cindy uh, and helping people get set up with OTN and I'm happy to meet with anyone at Sunnybrook um, to help you know, do your first virtual care visit because I know the first one can be kind of the trickiest, but for other people working at other institutions, I'm sure there are virtual care leads there that can provide that support. Fantastic. And thank you again for sharing this great information. I'm sure that's helpful to a lot of folks who are considering uh, using virtual care in their care. So thank you again, Philip, Cindy, and Caitlin for the great learning opportunity. And thank you to everyone for attending this webinar. We'll be sending a short evaluation survey by email. And so we ask that you share your suggestions for topics for future webinars and any suggestions you have on our webinars in general. We'd also like to highlight free resources that we hope every webinar attendee will share with caregivers of older adults with frailty. Caregiving Strategies comprises an online course, handbook, and website which were developed by the RGPs of Ontario with caregivers and healthcare providers as co-creators. And we'll send a flyer to help you spread the word. 
And finally, we would also like to invite you to attend our upcoming webinar on March 27th and the topic of Frailty Assessment Smartphone App, which will be presented by Dr. Paige Morehouse, Professor of Medicine Geriatrics at Dalhousie University. And we'll send registration information for this webinar uh, by email soon. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you next time and we're signing off now.